Happy 2019, Noobers. Welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast. If it's your first time today, welcome to the show. Uh, it's definitely a place to get better at spearfishing, certainly get some stories to improve your stoke and live vicariously through others if you're going through a winter or you're landlocked or something like that. But uh, definitely extracting tips from uh, some of the best Spiros from around the world is our mission here on the New Spiro Podcast, so welcome along. My name's Shrek, and uh, unfortunately Turbo's not with me this week. He's uh, still plugging away at his reno. I'm not sure when he's going to be back, but uh, hopefully at some stage early this year. But uh, yeah, look, we've got a cracker interview today. Tom Blanford. And uh, this guy's 74. He's a salty old sea dog, and I mean that in a respectful way. He's a... Uh, he's LA based and uh, or he was anyway in his career days and uh, he's uh, a phenomenal dude he when he was younger he, he takes the water so seriously he actually made like career and education choices to you know with college choices and stuff to be able to go diving more and uh, he's lived out of a tent and a van you know diving bar half a weeks at a time uh, he's had a couple of awesome great white shark experiences and um, and he even made me buy his book he emailed me and said, I just ordered your book, 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing. I'm looking forward to learning some good stuff. He says, I expect, however, to see one order from Australia for a dented badge, my first book. And he says, but on the serious side, I think you might enjoy the read. It was what cop work was like in LA in the 70s and 80s. And I actually, I went and bought a, I went and bought the book and uh, I read it. I, I finished it last week. I actually had a bloody good time. And I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm again reconsidering the idea of joining the police myself. Um, this was, uh, you know, just some of the stories coming out of the LA cops was uh, excellent. And uh, yeah, no, really cool book. And uh, and after sort of chatting with Tom, um, getting this, his, you know, you know, his career side of his story was really interesting as well. So, but today you were here for the spearfishing. So, um, yeah, enjoyed today's interview. But look, if you want to learn a bit more about Tom, check out his book, A Dented Badge on Amazon, and uh, and uh, and get into it. It's a great read. Um, all right, a couple of shout outs, and by a couple, I mean two. Um, Richard Metzger says, I absolutely love your podcast with Turbo and all the great interviews. You guys down under are keeping us going through the cold winter and keeping the fire stoked for the spring spearing season. I'm going back to the first interviews from 2014 and working forward. I just finished number 16. Keep up the great work. Hope you guys make the Blue Wild Expo in Florida in April. And uh, we would love to. Um, I'm not sure how finances are stacking up for this year, but hopefully we can get something going. And uh, hopefully with the advent of Patreon, um, you know, perhaps Turbo and I might be able to start traveling and coming out and doing some live interviews at different parts around the world and um, and just plugging in and meeting some of the some of you guys from everywhere and uh, it'd be it'd be fantastic to meet you in person but um the blue wild expo is definitely something worth checking out if you're a spear fisherman uh it's a florida highlight every year and um richard actually had a couple of guests to recommend as well so we might we might be talking to someone that helps organize the blue wild we'll see how we go but um yeah, that's what you got to look forward to in 2019. One quick review from Amazon. Guy said, amazing. Such a good resource to use. I recently just got into your spear f- into spearfishing and have since found New Spear Podcast to be an amazing source of a resource and wealth of information. So thanks, Mr. Lala on Apple Podcasts. Um, awesome review. All right, guys. Hey, let's hook in to this interview with Tom Blanford. And uh, there'll be a ton of information, resources, and photos linked up in today's show notes. So if you just search Noob Spiro, Tom Blanford, his uh, show notes po- page will pop up there in Google and you can get into any of the stuff we chat about today. Let's hook in. Today's Dynamite Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by spearfishing.com.au. That's right, the fine folks over at Adreno have been supporting the Noob Spiro podcast since about episode 18, and they help pay the bills around here. Just want to encourage you to check out spearfishing.com.au and use the code Noob Spiro. You can save 20 bucks on every purchase over 200 but it's just a great online shopping experience. The reviews are phenomenal. If you want to check out a new spear gun, new pair of booties, new pair of gloves, someone's used them before, they've written a review, it's on their website, it's all there right for, there for you. Head along to spearfishing.com.au and thank you for shopping with it. Today's major sponsor, Adreno. G'day Noob Spiro listeners, thanks for joining us today. I'm joined by Tom Blanford, who's in Arizona 
And uh, Tom was someone put Tom on to me. His actually his son actually put me on to him because he's got a, a very colourful past. He's been uh, diving and spearfishing for years. He was uh, actually one of the founding members of the LAPD dive unit. He's got a host of stories that I want to dig into. So welcome to the show, Tom. All right, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate you having me. No worries. Look, Tom, give us a little bit of an overview of um, of, of who you are and 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 how you got started spearfishing. Well, gosh, um, I started in the um, when I was about 13 or 14 years old, uh, and that would have been about the 1958 or so. And I would uh, we lived about eight miles from the beach, and we would uh, I would jump on a bus with a pole spear that I made and an inner tube, and uh, go dive in the marina. I'd dive at the jetty and shoot a little perch. And of course, today you couldn't do that. They'd throw you off the bus as being a terrorist. But uh, <laughs> anyway, that was how I when I first started diving, um, free diving, and, and trying to spear fish. Okay, so tell us a little, about, a little bit about some of those lessons you learned. You got off the bus with your handmade pole spear. Um, how did you go shooting fish? I had a, an, an inner tube with me and uh, would walk down to the um, to the jetty and uh, put mask and fins and snorkel on. And then I had a pole spear that we had surgical tubing attached to you know, to one end. And I, I had a frog gig at the other end. And uh, I probably speared more rocks than I did fish. But uh, it was always a lot of fun. I, mean, there was, I didn't have a wetsuit, uh, no weight belt. Uh, and, and it was just... Um, a matter of uh, just and very murky water, uh, you know, was a really poor visibility. But um, it was always fun, and uh, uh, I got some funny looks on the on the on the way back on the by the bus driver. But uh, it seemed to be <laughs> seemed to be okay. Can you remember one of the first fish you shot? Well, um, I think that one of the first fish when I was seriously free diving was probably um, a yellowtail or it could have been a white sea bass. Uh, but that was, that was sometime later when I really got into, when I was serious about uh, free diving and, and spearing fish. Um, I love to shoot yellowtail. They're one of my favorite fish. Um, I love to hunt white sea bass. They're, uh, uh, they're really uh, difficult to approach. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. They're a croaker. Yep. Uh, they're difficult. Yeah, they're difficult to approach. Uh, and the the, the slightest um, uh, unusual motion will spook them. I have a real quick story about a white sea bass that I speared at the uh, breakwater. And I was uh, the current was really running in one direction, and I was facing into the current. And um, a, a white sea bass came up uh, on the outside of me, and I looked over my shoulder and I saw it. I didn't think I could shoot it because I had to turn my gun 90 degrees, and I thought by the time I did that, it would be gone. But actually, it remained very close to me. I ended up spearing the fish when I got it back to the, the boat. It was blind in its left eye. Oh, wow. So I felt kind of... Yeah, I felt guilty about uh, spearing uh, this uh, nice fish uh, because it was blind. But uh, ah, anyway, you, that's uh, you put it out of its misery, Tom. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> that's a good way to look at it. I think you're, you're absolutely you're absolutely right. No, nah, I think this is when spear fishermen really are part of the ecosystem. You know that that fish probably wasn't going to survive. You, you never know, but um, maybe it wasn't going to survive very long without that sort of natural um, defense detection system. Anyway, you know. Um, Sure. So, yeah, it could. And, it, and I bet you it tasted good anyway. So did you have any people you started going with when you did get um, serious about spearfishing? Ah, okay. Um, well, actually, two. I have two mentors. Uh, one was Jack Pradonovich. I don't know if, if you know of Jack, um, but um, he, he's just a terrific guy. He's no longer with us, uh, but he was. Uh, he 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 built guns, uh, and he. I learned so much from him about uh, spear guns. Uh, and the other was a guy named Tom Murray, who was really uh, taught me more about diving than anybody else, free diving than anyone else. I think. Okay. Um, so I, I've got two two guys, and Jack. Uh, gosh, I could tell you, uh, we could. Sp- devote the program just to Jack, I think. Um, <laughs> for example, um, he had, uh, if, he, if he saw two fish swimming together, two yellowtail, two white sea bass, he wouldn't shoot either one because in it, and he, he strongly felt that they might have been mates and he didn't want to separate mates. I don't think that's the case, but uh, nevertheless, that's how he felt. And so he was, he really had respect for, for, for the prey. Yeah, awesome. That's a good person to learn from. Um, it's it's awesome when mentors sort of imbue a sense of ethics uh, with 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 their with the people that they're teaching. 
I spoke with Dan Walsh a while ago, and he has a lot of photos of some of Jack's guns. So did, did you have an early Jack Pradonovich gun? Oh, I sure do. I have, uh, I have several. Um, and I have uh, several of the spearheads that uh, Jack used uh, that were spring-loaded that were just uh, bulletproof. Um, and uh, also uh, some of the reels. Or I, I, I think I do have two reels that uh, Wally Potts, Made, I think Jack designed them and Wally made them. They were monstrous things, and they, but they did hold lots of line. So uh, yeah, I, I have I have some of Jack's stuff. Ah, awesome, awesome. Uh, no, it's good to see some familiar connections. It sounds like he was a very influential man in spearfishing. Um, so I, I also know you were one of the early members in the Long Beach Neptunes. Oh, uh, actually, no, I wasn't an early member. Um, I've been a member since about the, the late uh, 80s, but I'm, uh, there, uh, I'm probably one of the older members uh, today. But, uh, yeah, it's an interesting club. I, I, I've learned a lot uh, from uh, hanging out with those guys, and they're, they're fine spear fishermen, and, spear, and we have women in the club as well, and, and they do just an outstanding job. How many people are there in the Long Beach Neptunes? Oh gosh, I think there's at least a hundred. I don't have an exact count. I haven't looked at the uh, the recent roster, but probably at least a hundred. Okay, and is that, is that an active club? Is it good for new guys that are just starting spearfishing? Um, it, it is an active club, um, and it's if you if you started to spearfish, you need to be sponsored by someone in the club to be considered uh, for membership. Um, so, and, and there's some criteria, and I'm, I'm unfortunately I've forgotten what that criteria is, but um, you've got to dive to a certain depth and, uh, and stay down for a certain length of time, I think. Uh, and I may have that wrong, but there is a criteria um, so, so that they're, they're fairly selective. And then you, you, you might be a tentative member for a year, maybe two years uh, before you actually come up for a vote, um, you know, just depending on the membership. But, but it's an active club. And that's actually a very good question. Um, are you familiar with the uh, San Diego Bottom Scratchers? Yeah, yeah, I am. Oh, okay. I was just going to say that's uh, no longer active. I think the last member has uh, passed away. Um, and I think it's unfortunate that they weren't able to sustain that uh, membership. But, uh, um, boy, there's a group of terrific people. Um, uh, just I, 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 I've uh, got a couple of stories that I've read about them, and they're just really impressive. Uh, Jack would go out and, and, and spear white sea bass with a pole spear and no fins. <laughs> That's just incredible to me. Yeah, I just yeah. can't imagine that. But I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no. It's a, it's a good story, and uh, that, that's what it's all about. Um, I was going to say, does exclusivity, like putting some clauses on membership, do, does that help the club, the Long Beach Neptune? Oh, I th- yeah, I think it does help the club. Yeah, it's not uh, it's not easy to become a member. Um, so I think it does help the club. They're pretty selective. Um, uh, we have uh, folks that are that um, uh, are just outstanding spear fishermen. Uh, Terry Moss is a member of the club, and I'm sure you, you you've, you've heard of Terry. Um, so we have a lot of uh, real. Uh, oh, Jay Rife, uh, you got. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm sure your yeah. audience is heard of Jay. So we have a. a, a I'm at the bottom of the pole as far as that goes, but uh, <laughs> but the rest of the guys are all uh, all pretty squared away. So if you're learning in that sort of that LA area, um, what what's the best approach? Is there a club for guys that are um, just trying to earn their stripes and sort of you know um, you know get their first fish and things like that? Uh, yeah, there are, are a couple, and unfortunately, I, I right now I just can't recall their names. But uh, there there are a couple, and, and they they're also outstanding clubs uh, with uh, uh, an emphasis on ethics and and uh, uh, just doing the right thing uh, when you're in the water. Okay, cool. Hey, um, can you tell me about one of the best days you've had out spearfishing? Ah, oh, that's uh, that's simple. Um, the I guess it's the. The most memorable memorable day, I was at um, Soralvo Island, uh, which is in the Sea of Cortez. Um, the water was changing. It was warming and it was clearing up. And I, I was on top of a reef at the south end of the island. And I looked down and I saw a, a very nice uh, grouper. 
now I no longer shoot grouper t today, but then I, I, I would I would shoot grouper, and uh, so I was looking at this uh, fish beginning to pump up to to make a dive, uh, when I was surrounded by a school of oh gosh uh, 30, 40 pound tuna, uh, uh -huh. yellowfin tuna, yeah. So I'm so I'm looking at the grouper and I'm looking at the tuna, and then just about the time I was uh, going to make the dive. Oh, geez, a 50 or 60 pound wahoo swam right underneath me. <laughs> and he was swimming quick, quickly. Uh, there's no way I could uh, get a shot at it. So I'm now I'm really, you know, I'm really torn. What am I going to do here? So I thought, well, heck, I'll go shoot the shoot the grouper. So about halfway down uh, to the the bottom, um, a 101 pound amberjack swam right up to me, and uh, so I ended up uh, spearing the fish. Um, we had. Um, a, a long current line attached to the boat because the current was zipping a little bit and I had a loop in it and it was um, I, I was struggling to get to the end of that current line I finally got to the end of it and was just able to throw my arm through the loop just, if I hadn't have I'd probably be in uh, Japan by now but uh, <laughs> he was uh, really an impressive fish the Mexicans call him uh, Pez Fuertes uh, strong fish and they and as you know they, they really are strong fish yeah, wow, that sounds like a really fishy day. Was um, yes, and you know, a couple of days before, uh, I had shot four um, uh, amberjack, and the two were fifty pounds, and two were sixty pounds. And now the question is, what are you going to do with all these fish, right? <laughs> well, we gave the uh, those four uh, amberjack we gave away to local uh, pongueros, uh, the commercial fishing fishermen in uh, Mexico. Okay. And and the yeah, the one hundred and one pound amberjack we uh, drove into La Paz. And traded it for um, lobster dinners and all the margaritas we can drink. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a bloody good story. Um, it reminds me of a saying: uh, "No run, no fun." Which you know, like when the current's running, you know, sometimes that's when when a location can be the fishiest. Is that is that your experience? <laughs> Uh, it, yeah, it, it is, um, and um, it, yeah, I, I don't disagree with that at all. It, it uh, makes a lot of sense to me, um, and I know I, I know the commercial the uh, party boat uh, fishermen uh, they swear by it. Uh, uh, you know, they always look for current. And uh, there's a couple of other interesting points there. I, I thought um, your your developing sort of ethics with Groper. What, what's made you change your mindset with taking Groper? Well. Um, you know, they, it takes them a long time to get big, um, w w and when you shoot a big grouper, you're in for a, you're tied up for a couple of hours, or at least I always was. Uh, so it was a lot of work, um, and then I just didn't feel real good later on about shooting um, a fish that was, uh, uh, you know, that old. Um, and then what are you going to do with a hundred pound fish? Uh, you know, it's uh, that's always a problem too. So I. I you know, I'll shoot uh, Cabrilla bass, uh, which are like little groupers. So they're, they're you know, maybe 20, 25 pounds. Uh, but I, I probably wouldn't uh, – today I wouldn't – I don't think I would shoot a grouper. Okay, cool. And um, the line you had hanging off the boat with the loop in it, um, do you call that a mermaid line there and or is, do you call it a current line? Uh, I I've always called it a current line, and it was just a polypropylene line uh, that would float, and we had a buoy tied on the uh, the end of it, um, and um, um, it, I'd used it a couple of times. You know, but the dive boats, uh, the, the scuba tank uh, uh, divers, uh, they typically uh, put uh, put those current lines out, and uh, uh, so it's just it's a good. It, well, for me, it was a good idea. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we we use them too. They, we call them a mermaid line, and if you are diving in current and the boat's at anchor, um, it's a great sort of extra strategy to make sure that you've got um, something to grab hold of, even, you know, 50 metres out the back of the boat can be very effective. So, no, I like that. And um, hearing your, you know, sense of ethics with fish, I think, you know, that's something the experienced guys have a lot of. It's um, some ideas about, you know, the, the growth rates of fish and things like that. So, no, very cool. Do you want to replicate some of the best dives that you've ever experienced and capture some of those elusive species that only show up at certain times during the year? You need to go to Amazon and get yourself a Spiro Log, created by none other than Shrek and Turbo. Along with help from three experts that we've had on the show, we had Pat Swanson from New Zealand, Grant Ladle from Scotland, and Kevin Daly from the UK. These guys got on board, helped me create and craft 
a spearfishing log that can help you to replicate those days that stay strong in your memory, but maybe they stay strong in your memory, but you've forgotten some of the variables that culminated in that successful day. So you can capture these details every day, every time you go diving with 100 templates in the Spiro log available on Amazon now. Yosemite National Park. California. Red Sox. Hang loose, bro. <laughs> Spearingmagazine.com. Did you say SparingMagazine.com? I did, I did. What do you know about Spearing Magazine? I know that you can get eight issues for 30 US dollars plus shipping. But oh you've got to email it. Oh my God. Oh Lordy Lou. Oh. But what you got to do is you got to email Jeremy at SparingMagazine.com. That's oh. right. J E R O M Y at SparingMagazine.com. Oh my God. <coughs> $30 US for eight issues, Turbo? That is phenomenal value. Email Jeremy at SpearingMagazine.com. Jeremy at SpearingMagazine.com. J-E-R-O-M-Y at SpearingMagazine.com. What, what's, what's your favorite species to hunt? Uh, yellowtail. Uh, I, they're a jack. Um, they're, uh, they put up a, a terrific fight. They're real noble fish. Um, I know they have them off uh, New Zealand. I don't know if they have them in, in Australia or not. Yeah, both but, countries. Uh, yep. Oh, good, good. Okay. Um, and so I just have a lot of respect for them. Um, they're and, and they're curious fish. Um, even if you're not diving particularly well on one particular day, you know, it's uh, if if you happen to run into some yellows, usually they're pretty curious and they'll swim right up to you. You know, unlike a white sea bass, which is very, very difficult to approach. So I, I think probably yellowtail, uh, but I really enjoy hunting white sea bass too because they're difficult to hunt. Uh, you know, you have to be, I don't even kick with my fins anymore. If I'm really trying to, to find uh, white sea bass, I'll use my hands to, to pull myself um, through the water. And um, in fact, one other thing about white sea bass, uh, years ago I would swim in a pool just to try and stay in shape without a hood. And I realized that my fins were making a lot of noise. Ah. Uh, they were squeak. Yeah, they would squeak. You know, that I couldn't hear with a hood on, but uh, they would squeak with each kick. So uh, I put a little bit of WD-40 uh, inside the, the foot pocket of the fin, and that would reduce that that squeaking noise. Ah, and, nice. um yeah, it was just one of those, you know, they're so sensitive to noise. Uh, I don't know that it made any difference. Probably not, you know, but it, at least I knew I was a little quieter in, in, um, when I was hunting. That's a very interesting point. Um, David Hoshman, who who sort of lives um, out on the East Coast, he he says fins are no, the number one thing to, that scare fish away. So it's a very interesting insight you've sort of shared there um, in terms of quietening them down. Um, so a bit of WD-40, it fixes everything apparently. <laughs> yeah, apparently uh, <laughs> some of my uh, tree hugger friends, I uh, think if they were offended that I would put oil in the water, but it's not very much. <laughs> uh, the amount you're putting in there, I, I, I don't <laughs> yeah. think it's making a difference. Um, but yeah, well, okay. Some people like to get offended, I guess. Um, uh, okay, so getting back to Yellowtail just quickly, um, if you're headed out to, to sea and you are going to target Yellowtail kingfish, we, we call them Yellowtail kingfish down this part of the world, um, as opposed to the kingfish you have up there, which we call Spanish mackerel. But if you're, if you're targeting Yellowtail uh, and you're heading out in the boat, what kind of area are you looking for to, in order to target them? Well, I, I usually just look uh, for high spots, uh, rocky spots, um, you know, pinnacles. Uh, they tend to hang around that. Or when I dive the islands, which is uh, where I dive most of the time now uh, in, in the Sea of Cortez in Mexico, uh, I'll just run along the side of the island or, um, and, you know, and look for them there. Uh, one of my favorite spots is called White Rock. It's about 20 miles above the island, and it's a, just a rock that sticks out uh, about two miles from the beach. And it's really hard to anchor the boat there, but um, it, it just um, it seems to be uh, consistently um, uh, hot for yellowtail. I, I've just okay. almost never failed to shoot uh, shoot a nice fish there. And it's just basically rocky bottom. I go down, I ha maybe 10, 15 feet, hang on to the bottom, just wait for them to come by. Oh, wow. 
Okay, so is there there's a bit of current running over that or through that or against that? Uh, there can be, yeah, there there can be, and that makes it uh, that's uh, one more reason, I guess, why I just go down and hang on to a rock. Uh, but uh, yeah, there there can be some some currents. Uh, the currents at the north end of the Sea of Cortez are uh, are just uh, outrageous. Uh, you may get two, three, four knots of current. Yeah, well. um, yeah, and we spend a lot of time boating up uh, up there. Uh, at the north end, and um, one of my favorite places is a place called San Pedro Martir, uh, which is a tiny little speck of an island in the center of the Sea of Cortez, but it's just full of uh, yellowtail and lots of grouper, a lot of sea lions. Uh, there's rumors that there's white sharks up there, though I've never seen any, um, and there are a lot of uh, sperm whales and uh, hump, uh, and not hump, well, yeah, there are occasional humpbacks, uh, but we see sp sperm whales, humpbacks, uh, fin whales, and uh, it's just a, it's a real fishy place. It's just it's one of my favorite places to dive. Okay, cool. And um, you know, obviously the yellowtail are feeding on on something. Is there a particular bait species they like in that part of the world? Well, um, I can give you two examples. Uh, we were up at the north end of the Sea of Cortez. Uh, at a place called um, an anchorage called uh, Porto Don Juan, which is a hurricane hole, and we were preparing for a hurricane that was going to blow through. And uh, while we were getting the boat ready, um, we heard a school of yellowtail just ripping through on the surface. And then I looked down, and they were they were pursuing um, mullet. And um, it, as they passed through, or went after they left. Uh, there were dead mullet on the surface, and these were really big mullet. They were probably the size of your forearm. Okay. And um, yeah, we were in the midst of preparing for a hurricane, but <laughs> I, I jumped in the inflatable. My wife ran the boat, and I had to had my gun, and uh, we tried to follow them, but it was a waste of time. I mean, they were they were breezing through really fast, and they were hunting, and uh, but they did leave their mark. Yeah. Right. Um, Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I've seen them at Guadalupe Island also. In fact, it was really impressive. Uh, they were pursuing a school of, um, of mackerel, and they uh, there were a line of yellowtail. There were maybe uh, seven or eight in this line, and then one would kind of shoot out and take some take some of the bait, and then the, the other, another one would eventually come in and do the same thing. It was just really impressive. It was shallow water, and I got the impression that they were trying to herd these mackerel into even shallower water to, to feed on them. And so it was, uh, it was kind of a really cool thing to see. I'd never seen it before. So it sounds like they have an aggressive sort of feeding cycle there, and you've witnessed a couple of these kind of these, these boil-ups of yellowtail. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. That's they do. You're right. They absolutely do boil up. I've seen that a lot fishing. Uh, we do we do a lot of rod and reel fishing too. And um, my wife just recently hooked uh, maybe a thirty pound yellow uh, just right on the surface with uh, throwing some steel at them. Yeah, right. Okay, cool. All right, cool. And uh, look, we you mentioned Guadalupe Island there. You you get a mention in Terry Master's book about a story about some white sharks. So can you can you fill us in on some details? <laughs> Yeah, I, I probably could. I, I told the story once or twice, um, but uh, this was after uh, Terry shot his uh, fish, and um, uh, we were hunting, of course, for, for bluefin tuna, and uh, I was in the water with, uh, with Harry. Uh, the water was about 30, 30, 40 foot of visibility, I think, for pretty, pretty nice, uh, and we were over um, a reef. Uh, I had made a dive and was doing my typical routine of kind of sitting on the bottom and a, a very nice uh, bluefin tuna swam by me. Um, and uh, I, I think a lot of guys tend to overestimate the size of the fish. So I, I've always thought it was at least 150 pounds. So therefore it was probably closer to hundred pounds. But anyway, he presented a, a broadside uh, and it was a real easy shot. Uh, I had visions that I'd be standing on the deck uh, holding his tail with his nose on the deck, you know. But uh, he, he he ran for a few, well, for a few seconds, and then he stopped. And so when he stopped, I thought, well, I probably just stoned him. He probably severed his spine or something. And I'd dive down and find him on the bottom. So I went, went down, and I passed through uh, some bloody water and some little particles of fish. And I got down to the shaft, and it was uh, just a bare shaft uh, laying on the bottom. Oh, wow. So I recovered the shaft, yeah, went back up to the surface. And then uh, my, uh, my close friend, he's actually a much closer friend today than he was then, uh, Harry Ingram, uh, was uh, on the surface. Oh, and he was probably 30 to 40 feet from me. And uh, I, I was in the, in the process of reloading my gun, and I heard Harry yell, shark. 
and um, that always gets your attention, especially at Guadalupe. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I, th- I looked over at Harry, and um, s- seconds later, he was um, surrounded by white water, uh, just churning water. And one of the things that impressed me about it was the noise that it made. So uh, I saw the white water initially, and then I saw the back of this uh, white shark, and uh, Harry was eclipsed uh, by the dorsal fin, and I actually I still remember him rolling off the back of this uh, white shark. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, I, I I I really couldn't tell you how big it was, but it was a very large fish. Um, my thought was uh, Harry was probably dead, or he would be soon soon would be dead. He'd be holding his guts. Um, so I swam over to him, and he was fine. He was in one piece. Um, wow. His eyes were the, the size of uh, saucers, um, <laughs> and uh, but he didn't have his gun, and I didn't know it at the time. But he he had speared the uh, the shark, and uh, Harry, Harry literally climbed on my back. We were both frightened to death. Harry climbed on my back, and we were swimming back to the boat. And I yelled for him. I said, "Harry, stick your head in the water and look for that fish." And I, I'm afraid I I couldn't. Under, if the, I'm not sure if these are public airways or not, but Go the word that, words that he used, I, I would be inappropriate, I suppose. So, but he, <laughs> but it ended with you. <laughs> so <laughs> he said he wasn't going to look for that fish. But uh, anyway, the the, uh, the the guys on the boat, um, so they they witnessed the uh, the incident. They launched an inflatable. The inflatable was uh, parked between two rows of spear guns, and in the launching process, they put a hole in the uh, in one of the pontoons. And the two guys jumped in the water, Vance Carrier and uh, John Anderson. They jumped, uh, I'm sorry, they jumped in the inflatable. And they were trying to row over, uh, paddle over to us. Uh, They were using long oars instead of, uh, and each one used it as a paddle. So what, consequently, they were hitting each other with the ends of these paddles. So if I hadn't been so so damn scared, it would have been really funny to watch the inflatable slowly deflate as these two guys were. (laughs) Banging each other the, over the head with a with an oar, uh, but anyway, we got we got back to the inflatable and jumped in and uh, and we're fine. Wow! Uh, and uh, what Harry's story, uh, which is another aspect of the incident, uh, he was laying on the surface, um, he, looking down, of course, and um, all of a sudden he, at the very bottom, he, he a white shark or a very big fish materialized. Uh, he, he he saw it and then identified it as a shark and he, he popped his head out of the water and yelled shark, stuck his head back in the water and now the shark um, accelerated towards him and he, he's un, unclear but he believes the shark was beginning to open its mouth uh, and at that point he decided to shoot the shark. Now Harry's a Vietnam veteran, uh, he's um, uh, c- concerned about people that are in the water with him uh, and he wanted to warn everybody, and he, you know, he, he did that. Mm. And then he uh, took an aggressive uh, position, and that is uh, to shoot the shark. He mm. believes uh, he, sh- he shot the shark, and he believes that um, he, he believes that he that the shark's mouth was just beginning to open. It's all pretty unclear to him, as you can imagine, it happens very very quickly. Yeah. But anyway, he did. Uh, the only injury that he sustained was uh, from the, the cocking stock of the gun. That w- what we surmise is that the, the shark hit the end of the uh, barrel of the gun and drove the cocking stock into his shoulder. Oh. So he had a yeah he had a nice uh, bruise on his uh, shoulder, f- most likely from the cocking stock. But he was uninjured. As he was uh, un- un- not uh, not injured. And um, what was really kind of funny, the, the next morning for breakfast, uh, I made some pancakes for him, and I made it in the shape of a white shark. And uh, <laughs> he didn't think that was very funny at all. I, I can't imagine why. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, he gives me a hard time about that. But it was a real impressive, uh, impressive incident. And for, you know, from that moment on, I thought that if I uh, if I saw a white shark and it was aggressive, I would shoot it. Um, and, uh, it, because it worked for Harry, um, and gosh, two years later, um, I, a, a very big white shark swam right up to me at a place called Eagle Reef at uh, Catalina Island. And it was, uh, water was real clear and the current was really zipping along. It was maybe a knot and the kelp was, was, was laying down. 
And uh, all of a sudden, my mask just uh, filled up with the, the belly of this uh, big white shark. Wow. Uh, she, I, I, I'm, I'll probably refer to it as a she. I don't know, in fact, if it was a male or female. But it, it made a hard left turn and then made a 180-degree turn and then s slowly uh, swam up to me. It was not aggressive uh, at all. Um, it, it, it slowly swam up to me and stopped. And um, I thought to myself, uh, is this worked for Harry? Uh, even though it wasn't aggressive, I, I, I decided to shoot the fish. So I did. I shot it. And uh, what was really interesting or really amazing was there was no reaction at all from this fish. Uh, you know, I mean, you shoot a fish and they always react, right? No reaction whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like the old cartoons where uh, uh, Popeye cartoons where Bluto, somebody hits Bluto and he, he doesn't flinch. Well, that's how I felt uh, looking at this damn white shirt. Um, I can still see the belly and the line on the shooting cable uh, from, from the shaft sticking out of its head as it went back to my reel. Um, wow. it, it made a slow left turn, and to this day I can visualize its tail. Uh, sweeping left and right a few times to swim away. Uh, my son, who was in the boat, in our boat at the time, uh, sleeping, <laughs> I, I yelled for him to fire it up and don't worry about the anchor, just get that boat over close to us. And he did. Um, we, uh, we jumped on. He, he still kept taking line uh, from the, the, my reel. We pulled the hook, we, and we started to follow the, uh, the shark up, up the island. Um, I, it, during the whole process, I was trying to get my camera. I was trying to uh, look for my 45. I was, uh, and I was trying to. I was recovering line, but I didn't. I was worried about fouling the the line that I had recovered mm. with the prop on, on the boat. Um, finally, it, it surfaced, uh, and my son had a very. He was running the boat. My son had a real clear view of it, and he saw the shark shake its head several times and the, and the shaft popped out um, so and that was one of Jack's uh, spearheads that are just fantastic spearheads and uh, I, I know it penetrated quite a bit because I, we were just really close and I had a big gun with me so um, that was just um, a very very uh, impressive uh, uh, incident and, and what was really funny um, yeah, I'm sure you watch uh, Shark Week uh, when it when it's on. Occasionally, um, they, it's, it's, it's it's unfortunately it's sort of. <laughs> they, uh, I try not to watch it anymore because I don't I don't sleep well at night after I watch it. But anyway, uh, they had a shark expert. They have a shark expert, and I wouldn't do any good to name him at this point. But um, uh, I, I had talked to him on the phone about the incident, and he told me um, that I was he was disappointed that I had shot the shark. Yeah. He said um, the shark probably would, would only have mouthed me, would just just bitten me slightly just to, to, to make sure that I wasn't prey. And, um, I'm, you know, my thoughts at that time weren't, weren't real, um, weren't, weren't real positive, uh, <laughs> though I tried to, I didn't, I, I wasn't rude over the phone, but, uh, anyway, I thought, boy, that's really, uh, here's a real smart guy, but he's got terrible judgment, you know, uh, but, uh, that's, that happens, I guess. Yeah. Um, I've seen a few incidents with white sharks and uh, it does seem like, you know, obviously th there's a lot of signaling language they use. Like I've heard of great white sharks swimming next to each other and the one that's smallest will like they'll swim parallel to each other, like right next to each other. And that's to establish dominance. And the smaller one will turn away. And that's, you know, saying basically, you know, you're the alpha to the other shark. And uh, there's a lot of all this sort of language, which, um, and there's been some amazing experiences with freedivers in the water with white sharks as well, you know, swimming with them for an hour and things like this. But, you know, the reality of being confronted by a big white shark in, in, um, in, is, a, is a completely different experience. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you did the right thing or not, but, um, if, if you, you know, if you're worried about your safety, then w what do you do? Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm not one to elevate the, the life of a, of a white shark above uh, of, of, above a human, so. Me either. Uh, but I, but 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 I I agree. You, you know you don't know what would have happened. Um, but um, it it um, yeah, it was just an, an interesting experience. I have a, a an acquaintance who worked uh, who worked on one of the boats that would regularly go to Guadalupe and uh, and film sharks from the cages. You know they they would. Um, uh, I don't know if they're still doing that. 
But uh, anyway, he was there, and he he told me that they got to to the point where they would recognize uh, some some sharks, uh, and he said there were few. They were quite aggressive uh, to the to the to the to the cage and to the area, and there were a few that were just little puppy dogs. He said that they would have felt comfortable swimming with them. So maybe there's an an issue of personality there too. I, I don't know. But, some um, some they're some, impressive animals. Go ahead. Sorry. This, sorry. There's a there's a big theory as well that a lot of the cage diving is teaching sharks familiarity with us and association with food because they're bringing them in a lot of the time with chum and food. And then all of a sudden, people, you know, sharks see divers in the water and they begin to associate us with, a, with free food. What do you think about this idea? Well, it makes sense uh, to me. Um, I, I, I'm a real dog lover and, you know, dogs certainly do that. Um, and um, it... it, uh, it you know, I'm I'm not real fond of the idea of uh, trying to bring white sharks in. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know there are places where surfers are are, are feel that same way. Exactly right. Yeah. But, uh, and Guadalupe is such a. There's so many white sharks at Guadalupe, uh, and I think I've I've heard some stories that they think that the the population has even increased uh, there at the uh, at the island. So uh, I don't know if, that, if how accurate that is, but uh, interesting concept. I'd love to go back to Guadalupe, but it just uh, it just frightens me too much. Uh, you know, the thought of stumbling into one. They, the white sharks in particular have been reasonably well studied, but you know you can see where you know scientific and human interests sort of have an issue there in terms of, you know, the scientists want to get studied, close enough to study them and we don't really want them to become close to us because then it become, they become a threat. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, topic. In Australia, there's about 1,400 population on one coastline and about 2,000 on the other of great whites in particular. I'm not sure about the southern or the, the southern half of Australia, but it, it seems like we get a lot of big ones here. And, and at the moment, there's been some, some issues with them. But I think they're actually endangered or, you know, on the you know, the weary list at the moment uh, with regards to how, how big their population is. So it's a, it's a contentious issue, particularly in Australia at the moment. So it's an interesting conversation. Yes. Um, you know, to, I, I absolutely love white sharks. Uh, they scare me to death. Um, they're magnificent animals. Uh, I mean, they're just so impressive to see them. Um, and I, I wouldn't want anything to happen to the species. I don't think I... I would like to see them uh, where people spend a lot of time in the water. Catalina Island, for example, uh, that concerns me a little bit. You know, the, the number of whites uh, that are there. Uh, oh, by the way, are you familiar with the story about the uh, the white shark that was uh, killed at the Farallon Islands by a, an orca, a killer whale? No, no. Oh, okay. Well, this this goes back uh, to the late 1990s, uh, and there are a group of scientists uh, that camp out uh, at the at the islands, and what they do is they document the uh, predation of uh, the sea lions uh, for, by the white by the white sharks, and they'll document one or two cases uh, a day, and they'll do that apparently while the sea lions are at the islands. I suppose they're giving birth or they're uh, they're in, the, in that process. Um, and uh, they'll document it. Well, um, an incident occurred um, where a whale watching um, boat observed um, a, a killer whale attack and, and kill a white shark. And um, it was kind of interesting. If you if you get a chance to read the story, it's worth the worth the uh, time. I'll try but and anyway, link. what what is, what is really it? I'll try and link it up in the in the show notes today, oh, so that okay, way, that way listeners but, can check it out too. So I'd but, I'd love to have a read. Okay, but this is the best part of the story. Um, after the incident, after the the white shark was killed, and it was a male, it was about I think it was about a fourteen foot male. Um, all of the white sharks uh, left the islands, and it was still like in the middle of the breeding season for the, the sea lions. Uh, there was not. They, they they did not document one more case of predation um, uh, for the rest of that season. Um, so there was some speculation that there may have been some type of communication between this uh, white shark uh, that was um, that was killed by the uh, by the killer whale. Yeah, right. Now it happened. It, it happened again several years later, and I have heard that it's happened in New Zealand. Uh, I don't. I, I'm not. 
quite as confident about that, but I'm pretty confident that, about the second incident uh, at the Fairlands. So it's, uh, and, and this leads into my, to, to uh, <laughs> I just finished my, my second book, which is, this one is, is fiction, and it concerns uh, a white shark that is um, uh, pursuing uh, a diver that uh, killed its mate, uh, and it says it, it's it's not ready for it hasn't been published yet. Uh, okay, but it, it will be it will, it will be soon. But anyway, I just thought I would throw it in to get a free plug if I yeah, could. Yeah, no, no worries. So that'll be that'll be an interesting book. In New Zealand, um, a team of researchers actually captured um, orcas hunting great whites. So um, what they've actually even got a technique the 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 pod or the you know the local killer whales in New Zealand they they'll, they'll swim by a great white um, in extremely close proximity and they disrupt its um, balance yeah and then that's the first thing and then they turn around and they'll swim up alongside and they'll do a full like tail smash and try and break the shark's back and then, and then they all just chow down and, and eat it so and they've they've actually captured it they've captured this um, process happening several times so and it seems to be a learned behavior and but um and another interesting thing that I heard about great whites or I saw on one of those discovery channels was um, they tagged a whole bunch of sharks and they hunted like a pack of wolves and they were you know up to two miles apart but they were swimming in a coordinated fashion again hunting seals. And um, so there's definitely some some form of communication going on there that we're not quite quite aware of, I think. And um, they're an amazing animal, you know. Like um, the uh, even their detection systems are kind of you know uh, way way beyond what we understand. Uh, and and yeah, we had Warren Bird on from Hex Aquatic, and and he talks about you know shutting shutting down um, one of their sensory apparatus with. Um, by blocking this um, electrical signals, and uh, they're yeah they're they're amazing creatures. There's no doubt about it. There's another guy in New Zealand called Riley Elliott who's a shark researcher. I want to chat with him a bit more as well, but um, I'm I, I'm I'm a little bit wary of it because there's just so much controversy about sharks in general. And um, but uh, we'll we'll give it a go, and I'll say something ignorant. And it'll be good fun, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're 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 fascinating animals, uh, and, and like I said, I think they're magnificent. Uh, I just they just scare the hell out of me, and I don't I don't, I don't want to swim around with next to them. Yeah, I'd love to learn a little bit more about just how they sense the world around them. Uh, that ampullae of Lorenzini, it's uh, it's just something we don't really understand, um, and it's you got to get your head around it. I think. If, like many of us, you can't get along to a freedive training group or freediving course, then check out howtofreedive.com. This is a great online resource uh, for you to learn basically the physiology of what's happening in your body and also training techniques and what you need to improve your breath hold. Uh, There's spreadsheets, there's tracking, the whole thing's involved. It's absolutely fantastic. I've used the five-minute free dive course to improve my breath hold before spearfishing trips. Found it highly valuable. The best thing is there's a free taster course for you, so you don't actually have to part with any cash. Check out the free taster course if you like it. Go on, do the course. I recommend it. And you can also use the code NoobSpear at checkout. You'll save 20%. It's a bit of a no-brainer. Give it a taste. Have a crack. Hey, um, I also know that you you were in the LAPD dive unit, um, Tom. I, I want to hear a little bit more about this experience. How did that all happen? Well, uh, let's see. Um, it, it's in the probably the mid or late seventies. Um, someone planted a bomb aboard um, a. Uh, uh, a ferry in L.A. Harbor that blew up, and we, the department, realized they had no way to investigate this incident, and they wanted to investigate it, uh, you know, without moving the vessel. So um, a friend of mine, whose name is uh, Arlie McCree, uh, who was late, who's a member of the bomb squad and was later killed by a, a bomb that had detonated that he was trying to disarm, but he was also a diver, and so diver, he volunteered uh, to go in, uh, and um, he determined early on that yeah, that was most likely a bomb. So within the department, realized yeah, we 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 need uh, we, we need a dive unit, so we established it, and. Um, 
uh, I was the, w one of the guys uh, selected. I'm not sure the criteria was that difficult, but uh, I knew how to swim. <laughs> and uh, any, anyway, uh, they uh, so it was, we just uh, we worked on the diving. It was kind of cool. Uh, we did we got to dive in Marine Land. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Marine Land, but it's uh, an aquatic uh, center that's no longer there. They took it out, but um, you know they have fish and, and sharks and stuff to in their main tank. And we got to we got to do that. We got to I, I got to put on a Mark IV um, uh, hard hat, which was quite an experience. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, w one of the things about that was that I, I'm a, my feet are about size 13, and the boots that they the leaded boots were size 10. So it was uh, <laughs> it was that, that was the main thing that I remember about it. But yeah. uh, boy, you talk about a lack of mobility. There's just <laughs> not much mobility there at all. But it was kind of cool. Then we got to dive with the Kirby Morgan, uh, you know, the surface flight stuff. Uh, we got to um, uh, jump out of helicopters. That was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, search for, for bodies, uh, which didn't happen very often. Uh, uh, we also searched uh, for evidence uh, that was either thrown in lakes or ponds or the ocean. Yeah, that was that was uh, that was interesting. Uh, and but what is really interesting is what happened after 9/11. We had a, fr a fairly small dive team. We did nothing particularly significant. Uh, I mean, no, nothing really sophisticated. Um, but after 9/11, there was a lot of federal money. So now they have uh, uh, their own compressor. They have all their own gear. The city buys all the gear. They have several boats. Um, they even have a, a trailer that you can warm up in with a microwave oven. Yeah. So it, uh, it, it, it's kind of cool uh, the, how things have changed uh, with, uh, with the, the department's dive team. It's, uh, it's a, lot, uh, a, a lot different than it was when I, when I first started diving. Probably diving in a, in a police dive team or you know, a federal dive team is, is something that a lot of guys that are maybe – you know, love the underwater world will be interested in. How do you go about? So, do you know about how you go about getting into one of those jobs now? Well, of course, you have to be. Uh, in, in most cases, you have to be a member of the of the, of the department, um, and um, and then they they probably have uh, openings uh, periodically, and they'll test. Uh, they have a criteria. Uh, I, I at the time I happened to be a scuba instructor, so it was. Um, it wasn't too difficult to, for, for me to be in, selected, uh, but they were they were pretty um, pretty selective. Uh, you had to uh, you had to be comfortable. The main thing was to be comfortable in the water. Speaking of comfort, I can recall one training day we had it was actually a training night. There was a storm and it was raining, and uh, we took um, a Volkswagen and put a gun in the Volkswagen and threw it in the harbor in about 40 feet of water. It was next to the berth. Uh, where they tied up the ships so we had to locate it and then try to locate the gun so uh it was a stormy night it was uh, windy uh, lots of rain uh, the water visibility was just uh, a couple of inches um and, and we we're while you're at the surface debris would be floating by ugly stuff uh, things that like, once again you can't really talk about in the public airways but uh <laughs> but uh anyway we eventually found the uh the uh, car and i i happened to go inside uh, to try and recover the gun and that's the volkswagen i'm i'm a fairly big guy not a lot of room and, so, and of course we'd, we'd remove the seats but still there's not a lot of room in the darn thing but um i was trying to get uh I, trying to convince my partner to hold open the door because I didn't want it to latch when I got inside. Right? <laughs> well, the, the, there was also a current running, and uh, once I got inside, of course, the door... <laughs> <laughs> the door closed and latched and scared me to death. Right, I, you know, I, I couldn't get out of that car fast enough. But anyway, we, we did open we did open the door. We recovered it, uh, recovered the gun, re recovered the car. But um, it was really funny. We had a, a psychiatrist that was on the dive team. His name was Dr. Krofcheck, real interesting guy. And um, we did a, a brief uh, a debrief uh, after the incident. And he asked uh, everybody if they were scared, and he came to me, <laughs> and, I, and I, I, I made it real clear that I was quite scared. <laughs> and of course, the guy holding in the door said, "No, I wasn't scared at all." <laughs> so, yeah, it's one, it's one of those things. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. Um, this, this is a good segue too, Tom. Hey, what's the one of the funniest experiences you've had out um, spearfishing or on the water? Um. I think uh, the funniest was probably uh, at Cortez Banks. 
uh, which is a, it's a high spot about 100 miles off the beach in Southern California. There's kelp on it, um, and it's a really good spot for yellowtail, for big abalone, for uh, lobster, for, uh, yeah, uh, for tuna, mainly tuna. And um, we were hunting tuna, and we, we heard them way off in the distance. They were, they were feeding at the surface. So we, we jumped in the water, and then the, the school swam towards us, and uh, we were being just uh, swarmed by these uh, tuna. They were bluefin tuna. And what was really funny was there was about a 30-pound yellowtail that was trying to catch up and stay with the tuna, and it just couldn't do it. You know? <laughs> and and it, it was just uh, – it was swimming real hard. It was really kicking its tail. And, you know, with tuna, you can hardly see them move their tail, right? But this, this uh, yellowtail was just going berserk, trying to catch up and stay with these tuna. But um, that's uh, one of the funniest things that brought a good chuckle <laughs> to me when I, when I saw it. And, of course, I never speared the yellowtail or the tuna. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's usually the case with me. That is one of the funny things with a lot of those animals that move between pelagics. They they want to find um, another school to be with because otherwise they're vulnerable out on their own. So poor thing trying to keep up with a bluefin so that, that picture reminds me like turbo just pretty much trying to keep up with me so <laughs> he, he's normally my co-host so he can be the yellow tail and i'll be the bluefin <laughs> well it, it, you know there, there is one more funny incident uh, we were anchored in la paz in mexico in yeah. Baja, and uh, and and there a school of bait fish were underneath the um the boat and there are a lot of porpoise in the bay. In fact, there's, there's a lot of whale sharks in the bay too. But the, the porpoise were, would, uh, they would, one of them would dive down below the boat and blow bubbles, a uh, stream of bubbles. And then at the, about the same time, another one would swim and take, a, you know, hit, hit some of the bait fish. And they did this for hours. Um, and I, I really got, I, I know whales do it. Uh, when they feed, they'll blow a curtain of bubbles. But I didn't know that porpoise did it, and uh, I was just really impressed. I'm not sure if it was funny, but it was really impressive to watch these uh, porpoise uh, work as a team uh, to feed. Yeah, right. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Now the, I've seen some interesting photos of dolphins blowing bubbles. They, um, that, that free divers call them colloidal vortices, I believe. But yeah, there's definitely an art to it. But they they make us look silly the way they do it. It's amazing. Oh. So Isn't that the truth. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, what's in your dive bag? Um, you're still diving a lot these days. So how 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 old are you, by the way, Tom? Uh, I am 74, and yeah, I still I still dive. I uh, I I really uh, enjoy being in the water. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I I think. Uh, my dive bag probably is uh, typical of most uh, of most dive bags. Uh, the one thing that I do carry with me in the water is a tourniquet, um, and, and not necessarily for a shark attack. In fact, I think you're more apt to get hit by a prop. Yeah, I think we've all been real close to being smacked by uh, by a prop. Um, so I, I, I keep it uh, on my weight belt. It's attached uh, to the weight belt, and I can quickly grab it. And I've never had to use it, and I'm sure at this point I probably never will. But uh, it's it's, uh, it's kind of nice to, to, to know that it's there. Uh, I also carry a light um, that I use mainly for when I'm hunting for abalone, but it's a very small light, but it's very powerful. What's the brand? Um, uh, it's called a um, Tovatech. T O V A. T E C. Okay. Uh, and as you can charge it just by using your computer with a, a, a USB. Yeah, USB cable or a connection, and it uh, it's got a long life, uh, and it's really a powerful light. I mean, and I and I it's I take that with me all the time too, awesome. mainly because uh, I think the older I get, uh, the more. It's not that my visual acuity is different. It's not. But I have a difficult time. For example, if I have a black wallet and it's on a black tabletop, I, it's hard for me to see it. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's just part of the aging process. So I use it for that reason too. Yeah, no. That makes sense. And, um, I mean, we've all experienced that. Like you're swimming out in the water and it's light and then you swim under an overhang and it blacks out. And sometimes it'll take you five, ten seconds for your eyes to adjust. If you've got a torch, you can kind of avoid that. Well, and with the aging process, it takes that five or ten seconds is now 15 or 20 seconds. You know? <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm well aware of that. And that's one of the things that I'm dealing with now is, uh, you know, the aging process. Uh, uh, 
but how you how can you remain in the water and be real active? Uh, and so far, I've been able to do it. I've, I've had a uh, I've got an irregular heartbeat, uh, atrial fibrillation, but I'm asymptomatic. Doesn't bother me. Perfect. Uh, if, yeah, I've had uh, a couple of back operations, uh, but in the water, I don't really notice it that much. Uh, I've got a torn ACL, uh, but once again, in the water, I don't, I don't notice it at all. So it's, ah, uh, you know, it's, I'm really fortunate uh, in, in, in that regard. That's awesome, Tom. Um, and you're still in the water at 74, so that's friggin' excellent. I was going to say, the tourniquet, what, what, is there a brand of that, or what material are you using? No, it's uh, what it is. It's 400 pound monofilament, and you know how some guys will use uh, a stringer. They'll have a, a short piece of, oh, maybe a six inch piece of stainless steel. Yep. And they'll drill a hole through, it and they use it as a fish stringer. Yep. So I, 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 I've got a loop in it, and I, what I can do is I can wrap it around uh, a, a limb, and then uh, put the the um, bar through the loop, and then tighten it down, and then tuck one end of the bar underneath the. The, uh, now the, the tight monofilament mm. um, and uh, I, I've never used it I've tried it of course I practice with it occasionally um, and uh, um, and it, I think it would work uh, I don't know that it would work on, on me on yourself I mean if you're a, you know if, if a shark just took a nibble out of your leg it might be tough to do it yourself but you know for somebody that you're diving with or a victim of a, of a someone who's hit by a prop um it, i think it would be okay yeah. but i think it's important it's really important to practice those things yeah uh, for example on, on the dive team uh we would practice um uh mouth-to-mouth resuscitation in the water uh which is really very very difficult to do in fact you can't do cpr in the water because you became because of the chest compressions but you can give mouth-to-mouth so we, we practiced that um and it was uh, not very much fun but um but anyway <laughs> Anyway, yeah. uh, it, but it is important to practice those. Uh, and you don't realize how difficult it is until you have, until you actually do practice. And then um, when you're finished, if you've got a good bunch of mates, or friends, when you when you're practicing, it makes it a lot of fun. But um, you actually realize the value of it too, because without that practice, you you think you've got some idea, but really you've got none. And uh, it's, it's it's tough in the water, particularly. Yeah, and what's, what was odd was uh, putting your lips up next to somebody else's lips, and both of you have a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a new experience. I'm not being judgmental, but that was just a new experience for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's that's true. Hey, um, all right. Look, last part of the show, Tom, is a Spiro Q and A. So this is a faster pace sort of round of questions. Um, during your, you've been you've been spearfishing for sixty years. Well, I, I've been, uh, yes, not but not seriously. Uh, maybe seriously, the last thirty years. Uh, okay. But okay. Well, during all of your you know times and experiences spearfishing, what's maybe one of the single biggest lessons you've learned? Oh, I think um, it's to respect the the prey, uh, the fit, and, and I didn't learn that early on. I, anything that swam by, I'd shoot. Um, but now uh, it's, a lot, it's, a, it's a lot for now. So I think respect for the prey. Okay, cool. Um, what's the single best piece of advice you've ever been giving? Uh, stop hyperventilating. Um, one of my mentors would hyperventilate 20, 30 times before each dive, and then finally, that finally sunk in that that's not a good idea. So that, that probably was the best advice I had. Yeah, nice. And um, what did his sort of hyperventilation technique look like? Was he just taking rapid, shallow breaths? actually fairly deep breaths um they weren't that shallow and um he would uh well, probably a minimum of 20 exhalations uh and exhale as aggressively as he could um and um i and, and i did that um uh, and fortunately i wasn't that good an athlete i think really really good athletes uh have, you know they have a, a real good possibility of shallow water blackout but i wasn't that good so it <laughs> probably wasn't as dangerous for me but uh you know that, but it was good advice uh, to stop hyperventilating are you very humble tom i'm i'm uh, I'm, I'm sure um i'm, I'm sure you you're nowhere near as uh as bad as you, you say yeah uh, um what, what what's the reason guys hyperventilate just quickly um i i, I just want to dig into this in a little bit well, I, I think it's because they, they feel that it's important to dive deep and to remain down for a long period of time. Uh, and I think, um, and I don't think that's the case. I don't think you have to dive deep. I don't think you have to make three-minute dives. Um, 
you know, and I, I think that they feel the longer you're down, the more uh, the, the, the greater the chances are that you're going to, to be a, to hit a fish. Um, and and I, I've actually lost uh, several friends from uh, shallow water blackout. Um, and um, one guy was uh, really, really good at uh, hunting white sea bass, and he would uh, um, he commonly, in fact, occasionally he would make a dive and he wouldn't even inhale. You know, he would exhale just so he would sink down very quietly without uh, making a dive if he was close uh, to a, to a white sea bass. And uh, of course, when you, you know when you drown, I mean, when you when you when you um, uh, when you're hit with shallow water blackout, th that cannot be determined in an autopsy. All they can do is say, well, he drowned. Uh, so there's, as far as I know, there's no way to make that determination. But um, I, I know of, uh, well, I know of an, another fellow, a, a club member who, uh, who drowned most likely from shallow water blackout. Another one was killed by a white shark at uh, Guadalupe a long, long time ago before I was a member. And, um, so I, I guess that's it. I, I just yeah. think that's uh, that's the criteria. It's, yeah, that, it's necessary. It's something a lot of guys get taught, and it's even in several old spearfishing books. It's um the the big um shallow fast breathing. It it, it um it hides your 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 urge to breathe, and it, and but it actually doesn't increase your breath hold at all. It just gives you the illusion of it, and it it stops your body from signalling you to to surface, and so. Yeah, it's definitely one of the major causes of shallow water blackout. So awesome. Uh, sorry we uh, spent a bit more time on that, Tom, but wanted to dig into it. Um, <clears throat> so you're 74. What current challenges uh, do you face apart from your eyesight? And how are you approaching them? Um, just the uh, aging process. Um, I, uh, that's that's uh, that's it. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not in the water as long as I, I used to be. Used to be, I'd be the first one in the water and the last one out. But you know, those days, uh, I don't do that anymore. Um, and challenges. Uh, gosh, um, I, you know, I, I really can't think of any other than the uh, dealing with the aging process. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm fortunate in that in, in that regard, I, I suppose. I think one of the best ways to overcome the aging process is to stay active like what you're doing and uh, good on you for staying in the water. It's pretty cool to keep you stoked going all this time. So, hey, um, who's one of the best people to go spearfishing with and why? Uh, somebody who has who will not get you in, in, into trouble, someone who has good judgment. Um, I, I think that's uh, that, that would be my criteria. Um, the only time I, I think it's a few times that I've been in trouble in the water, it's been because somebody else has done something that they probably shouldn't have done. Um, so uh, that's my criteria: somebody who's got good judgment. And by the way, there's no correl. I don't. I don't think there's any correlation between somebody who's bright and somebody who has good judgment. Uh, I, I think the two are, are, are quite distinctive. You know? <laughs> that's a good. Uh, that's a good distinction there. <laughs> All right, hey, last question, Tom, and I've had a ball chatting with you. Um, could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in uh, one or two sentences? Um, the uh, hunting, I, I think the one word would be hunt to hunt. Uh, I, 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 uh, I guess it's just a primitive uh, reaction, I suppose. It's just the, it, the idea is uh, I, I really enjoy hunting, and, uh, and, and, and I try to respect the prey. And, and I love to eat fish, uh, so I, maybe it's that, that, that's a, a, the combination, I guess, hunting. That's awesome. Hunting, hunting instinct. That's a pure reason to go spearfishing. Uh, you brought a quote to mind. It's by Ed Zern. He says, I don't view nat nature as a spectator sport. And uh, I, um, I res respect your sentiment there completely. Uh, I love the hunt. It's a big part of spearfishing and a big part of the appeal. Hey, awesome chatting with you, Tom. Where can people come and find you? Are you on social media? No, I'm, I'm really not. Um, I, I, actually, I am on uh, Facebook, but I don't. I, I, my wife uh, reads that I don't. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not really active with social media. I, I should be, I suppose. But uh, I, um, I, I do check email quite a bit, and I, I don't, don't have any any problems giving you my email address uh, if you'd like that. No worries. I'll, I'll link that up in the show notes and maybe might want to find out a little bit more about the Long Beach Neptunes or, or something else you're up to. Are you up to anything else at the moment, Tom? As, um... Well, 
oh, I had a couple things that I was going to talk about, but I, I've forgotten what they were, and it's uh, probably not important. Not important anyway. You've done a, a great job of uh, of, um, uh, of of interviewing and, and touching uh, really important points uh, that I think are important. Oh, you've got a rich um, tale of stories there, Tom, as I'd expect from the amount of years in the ocean you've spent. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure to catch up with you today, and uh, really want to thank your son for um, linking us up and giving me a couple of insights into your life and your story. And uh, like I said, real pleasure to chat with you today. Uh, you know, he's a he's a great kid. He, he really is. Uh, I, I admire him and uh, all my all my children. But he's uh, he's special. All right, all right, Tom. Well, uh, we'll catch you later. Okay, you take care. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Tom. I sure did. It's great um, chatting to some of these more, ex- you know, really experienced guys. And uh, and I'd encourage you to go and check out his book, A Dented Badge, on Amazon and learn a little bit more about the career side of his life because uh, he, he had one hell of a time in the LAPD and, uh, you know, some real characters there. Uh, in his show notes today, if you type in Noob Spiro, Tom Blanford, you'll see a picture of a big white sea bass um, shot at Catalina Island. And, um, you know, that's also one of the locations um, where he saw one of the big white sharks. And uh, uh, the, and the story about shooting the shark today really um, triggered some ideas for me about getting on, um, you know, the, some shark experts to just have a bit more of a discussion about sharks in general. I've had some um, some mail in the past about, uh, about sharks, so it'll be interesting to um, explore that topic a bit more with some uh, some lively debate and some stats, maybe with some scientists, and uh, we do a whole lot more learning. But anyway, hey, in a fortnight, again, a fortnight is two weeks for my American friends, um, we are headed back to America. We're talking with Justin Baker. Now, this guy's been sponsored by a whole bunch of um, companies, uh, spearfishing companies in the past and, and present and he's a fantastic dude really really cool guy about how he got into spearfishing and um, talks a little bit about the lifestyle he led before spearing and uh, so yeah I hope you enjoy that and uh, yeah so join us again in a fortnight and yeah leave us a review wherever you listen to the show that'll be fantastic Adreno Spearfishing are today's proud sponsor of the Noob Spiro podcast. They stock a huge range of equipment that you can find in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and now Perth. That's right, spearfishing.com.au have got a huge range of gear. I encourage you to get along, use the code Noob Spiro, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O and save yourself $20 on every purchase over $200 when you shop online. Hey guys, thanks for listening to today's episode. If you are trying to improve your spearfishing, then you're in the right place. This podcast and our spearfishing community has got one of the best places to learn. Come and join us on the Noob Spiro community on Facebook. And uh, you'll get access when you sign up to the Noob Spiro email newsletter. It's called The Floater at noobspiro.com. Just pump in your your email and join our community. You'll get the dive day checklist and 10 tips to become a better Spiro as well. And uh, as as always, we, we would love a review wherever you listen to the show. If you put in a genuine review, it helps other people find the show. Tell your mates about it. Jump on their smartphone and even download a couple of episodes and tell them what a bloody podcast is. All right, guys, let's check you next week. Thanks for listening to today's Noob Spiro podcast. Shrek out. Shrek out.